thank you for making the time. Uh, I didn't realize comments was today until way too late, and I'm sure you have a busy schedule, so I really appreciate it. Um, and today we're going to talk about, in general terms, like we're going to start with sea level rise um, and looking at design's role in this sphere, um, and then kind of narrow down into specific projects that that I've seen that your firm has worked in, Reed Hildebrand, um, and then also projects that I have working through Ocean Conservancy, my current um, organization. And so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, tell you a little bit more about Ocean Conservancy, and then I'll ask you to do the same. So my name is Daniel Padilla Ochoa. I, I graduated from GSD with an urban planning concentration and then like a side concentration in urban design. Um, I did consider doing an MLA, but I ultimately decided against it and decided against saving myself two years <laughs> of tuition. Um, but after that, I joined Ocean Conservancy. Luckily for me, it was in January of this year, so right before everything started with COVID. Um, and Ocean Conservancy in Florida has been working on water quality and sea level rise at large. So water quality from freshwater and saltwater sources and sea level rise basically at all coasts here in Florida. Um, as an organization, Ocean Conservancy has been around for close to 50 years. Actually, it's going to be 50 years next year. Um, and they're based in DC and have offices in Miami, like myself, and also in Alaska, doing a lot of Arctic work. Um, and it's all kind of like a policy organization, as you would expect, but it's back through a team of scientists and back through a lot of programs that we sponsor and we also um, produce. And so that's kind of the nature of Ocean Conservancy. And my work specifically, and the reason that I asked you to join me on this call, is developing partnerships in Florida to address the two op topics that I mentioned before. Um, and more particularly with municipal governments. So the, the first partnership that we developed in Florida was with the city of Miami, which I'm sure you are familiar with, um, mm -hmm. because it's, it's has, it has like so many different opportunities and a lot of different challenges, most challenges and opportunities. We decided to partner with them to try to push environmental like protection and conservation and specifically like marine time. Um, and one of the big things that we're trying to do is do a plastic intake survey in the Miami River. So it's the first one that's going to be done in the U.S. Um, and really what it's trying to look at is find the pollution sources in the river um, and then from there hopefully try to push projects, either, um, either rehabilitation projects on the river, so try to do the new developments that are coming up, or also trying to do policy for um, like pollution um, like ordinances and things like that. Um, next up, we're actually working on our partnership with the city of Miami Beach. And so Miami and Miami Beach, one, are right next to each other, and more importantly, they provide uh, like a network solution, right? Because Miami is inside of the lagoon of Biscayne Bay, and Miami Beach is basically the barrier island to the peninsula, right? Um, and so the, the challenges are different, but they work hand in hand. And so now it, it's gotten to the point where we're trying to make sure that all the, all the practices and all the recommendations that we push forth as Ocean Conservancy to the cities uh, makes sense, not just in a piecemeal solution, but makes sense for the region in its entirety. Um, and then as we make our way up the coast and to the Gulf, um, we'll, we'll have to make sure that all these pieces are working together and that our recommendations make sense. And so with that said, um, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about your work, about the firm, Reed Hildebrand, um, and your interest in general about sea level rise? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for talking with me. Um, well, my firm, Reed Hildebrand, is a landscape architecture firm of 50 people. We are um, located in Cambridge, um, Massachusetts, and we've been in business for almost 25 years. We are um, we have a small office in Connecticut as well, New Haven, where we have a whole lot of work in Yale and other um, other institutions and, and private clients there. Um, you know, the firm works largely in the U.S. We have done a little bit of work in Europe, um, just a couple of very special uh, projects that were great opportunities for us. And the range of our work is extremely wide. You know, we do some work for private land owners. We do a lot of institutional work. Maybe about fifty percent of our work is with colleges and universities and um, arts, largely arts organizations, museums, um, cultural organizations, and we do some developer work because um, this is where we uh, have our greatest opportunities to shape the public realm. Um, 
I'm also the Hornbeck Professor in Practice at um, the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. And in that role, I largely conduct research and design studios at the uh, option level, at the graduating level students. And they have been focused um, both on um, uh, urban vegetation, uh, specifically uh, the ways in which we promote successful growth of the urban forest. Um, and by that, I mean all of the vegetation in the city from the canopy to the Golden Bay. And then uh, more recently, um, uh, climate change uh, is, is, is pretty much our number one agenda in the Department of Landscape Architecture. And uh, so, uh, you know, last year I had a, just a really great opportunity to engage the topic in a very deep way um, on the eastern shore of Virginia. I know that you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Also, just um, coming off a presentation yesterday uh, in Washington, D.C., for our work um, with four other design firms uh, in a kind of collaborative effort on um, what to do about the tidal basin in the face of climate risk. Because the tidal basin, which is part of the monumental core in Washington, is failing, uh, both due to subsidence and, and rising uh, water in the Potomac uh, and the tides. And so, um, you know, the, the combination of projects there has brought me a uh, pretty serious focus on climate risk issues. I'll add one third um, component to this that might be of interest to you. We are producing for the city of Cambridge an urban forest master plan, one of the few you would find anywhere in the U.S. Um, because the city is, uh, is deeply uh, committed to changing the variables on climate risk for its citizens. And um, so we've been working for a year and a half now, and we have another, potentially we have another six or eight months to go, um, essentially to um, rewrite the ordinances around tree protection and institute policies uh, citywide that will grow urban canopy to a higher percentage than the city has now. It, the city has seen decline in the canopy, and so we're trying to both reverse the decline and grow the canopy. So the, the panoply of things that we're working on, you know, we work on coastal sites all over, um, you know, climate risk is uh, front and center. Yeah, and, and I took like a gander through, through all the projects that you guys have. Um, and, and at one point in the conversation, I want to get to this idea of should design or like even the construction projects or infrastructure should they be geared towards preventing like a carbon footprint? Should they be trying to prepare for, for example, sea level rise or ocean acidification or heat waves? Or are we at the adapt phase, right? Or are we talking about should projects have lifespans that maybe in the coal science we'll, we'll, we'll lose them eventually? And so how does a project yeah. react to that? And can that be designed? Um, but I'll touch upon that uh, in a little bit. And yeah. I, I had heard about the Urban Forest Project, which is really interesting to, to see like that it's progressing. Um, and it's, I mean, it's such a, it's, it's a big kind of bite at trying to increase, right, the permeable surfaces that a city can have. Um, I'm really, really curious. I'm, I'm a fan of Cambridge's work in terms of how they carry their, their, their like organizational structure and how to advance like the livelihoods of people. So I'd be curious yeah. to see how that develops. Um, I got a question on the call out for DC for the, the four design firms. Is that, that sounds like a Hurricane Sandy kind of rebuilt by design setup. Is that kind of what it feels like? This is uh, a, unlike anything I've participated in. Um, so uh, there's been concern for years, you know, this is a site that's owned by the National Park Service as all of the monumental core is. And therefore, um, because it's, of course, you know, national treasure, uh, you know, it's protected by Section 106 Historic Preservation Act. But the reality is that you can't preserve the tidal basin in place. Well, you could, if you wanted to raise it all six feet, and in some cases even higher, I mean, we'd really have to make a kind of um, a, um, a, a barrier you know, at, at elevation 18, if you wanted to 
preserve it in place. So, and that's not desirable. And, you know, the initial cost of just raising the seawall was a $300 million project. So, so because the Park Service is governed by, you know, Section 106 law, um, with fairly tight strictures on how it approaches preservation treatment of cultural assets under its ownership. Um, two other, two nonprofits got together with the Park Service to conceive of this situation. So one is the, the Trust for the National Mall, which was set up about a dozen years ago to be able to raise private funds that could be used in the monumental core. Uh, so, and, and they've been working hard for a decade or more, uh, you know, on finding ways to make bigger improvements. And, and you know, the Park Service has really redone the Lincoln Reflecting Pool and the mall in the last 10 years. And, you know, these were two massive projects that, um, that required private funding in part, at least. They teamed up with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which also have, you know, is a kind of policy organization like your own, um, but they also have ownership um, of properties. And, um, and, and they decided that they wanted to do something that was outside the box, outside the strictures of the Park Service's orthodox way of doing preservation planning. Um, they got they hired um, a young guy from SOM who runs their uh, SOM's New York um, design, urban design practice. Um, and uh, he helped them to seek to find funding. They got some funding from American Express. And they, 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 they fashioned a, a project which would invite five US firms to engage with them on the problem, kind of problematize this very difficult policy question and pr produce designs that would be uh, provoking deep discussions around policy and response to 106. Um, and so we, uh, we were asked along with Walter Hood and uh, uh, James Corner Field Operations, Vistas and Guthrie Nickel, and D-Land Studio in New York, run by Susanna Drake. We got together in, uh, in the fall and toured the site and you know, made a lot of resources available to us. We all got together in February for a day long, um, an evening and then a day long um, conference presenting initial thoughts. And then we were planning, of course, to have a, a live meeting in Washington um, uh, which turned into a, a, a big Zoom meeting yesterday, which we presented. So, so there are five approaches on the table right now. No winner. Here's the difference between rebuild by design and the um, Tidal Basin Ideas Lab. The Ideas Lab doesn't have a winner. We felt uh, this was one of the reasons we wanted to participate. And we, um, we were pleased, uh, you know, in a way to be more collaborative with the uh, what you would otherwise call competitors, all of whom are close friends of mine, by the way. Um, I, I don't know that that was known, you know, to the organizers, but um, but we all we are all friendly competitors. Um, and so, you know, as I say, a, a very different effort um, to you know our typical design competition thing, where you know you just just all kinds of secrecy and. Um, you're, you go all out to win, but you're very careful not to be too speculative, um, you know, and, and so on. So, the, so, so what we saw yesterday uh, was there were really some quite speculative, um, very imaginative solutions for, um, you know, creating a levy. Uh, essentially, everybody in some way creates a levy, and it's really interesting to see the different ways of doing that. So, uh, really a fascinating experience. I mean, the, it's, it's not just the issue of sea level rise in Washington, and it does really impact the city because, you know, the, the hundred year flood, the, the, the hundred years from now flood scenario floods all of the federal triangle and a lot of them all, and all of the Lincoln reflecting people. It's not just that, it's actually that this is the preeminent memorial landscape 
in America. You have you know monuments to Thomas Jefferson. You know you're, 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 you can't miss the Washington Monument, uh, Martin Luther King, um, you know uh, FDR, George Mason, and so. Maybe the most unique thing about it is that the cherry trees, right, with this world famous cherry blossom festival, are in fact a memorial landscape. And yet they're dying because of some salt intrusion in their soil. And, um, you know, there's some of the trees are submerged, you know, twice a day, it's, you know, some tides. So, very interesting problem of how to um, migrate a living landscape memorial, a commemorative landscape that's alive. Well, I hear that. And, and I've seen projects, it sounds fascinating, and I've seen projects yeah. where there's like a, like a system like the, thing, the first thing that you propose, which is like a barrier island basically and trying to elevate the entire soil, but then that leaves the the consequences of like, for example, like a tidal wave or even like forced attenuation to to the surrounding areas, right? And so you're kind of just pushing off the problem to to whoever else is going to receive that brunt. Um, but this this sounds like really interesting, and I love the idea that it's not competitive. Um, and and what what are the next steps from this? Like, what what's going to happen now? The plan was that. This was going to be curated over the summer uh, for a six month long exhibition at the National Building Museum. Um, that's all in question now. I think that the boot sources are thin, suddenly thinner than usual. Um, and so uh, we're not sure when you could have an exhibition. So um, we haven't heard really, but you know, I think they're trying to conceive of some considerable online presence for the work. Maybe a publication. Um, I, you know, if you think about it, you know, it's five, you know, frontline landscape architecture firms working for something on, for five months, study. and it, you know, it's 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 really a pretty rare, you know, with a landscape of this importance. So hopefully, something significant will come of it. For me, most especially, the policy discussion that was framed. Which is how do you what, how do you interpret the Secretary of Interior standards for preservation under rehabilitation so that you could actually move something because this is a problem we are going to be facing. You know that's why you have an Ocean Institute, but this is a problem we're going to be facing on every coast and every river. Um, you know all over the world. Really. Some cases more severe than others, Miami especially. No, oh, definitely. And I think the conversation usually is centered around like the cultural memory or like the idea of, of like a legacy having to leave and, and having to retreat yeah. and manage form ideally. Um, but oftentimes we think right. we also forget that a lot of the, the value in the space are are the, the kind of the emblems that represent like all the things that we built. And so I think the, the memorials in DC are, are like, you know, the epitome of that and having to think about how can we relocate this and within the political boundaries and the policy boundaries, that presents like a whole different set of problems, but I think it's one that we're going to have to think through, right? Um, like I, even I was looking at um, in downtown Miami, there's, there's like a site or there's a circle, it's called the Tequesta Circle and it's like the, the first um, inhabitants before, not the first, but the last native inhabitants before uh, they started becoming a colony. And, and there's been talks about kind of having to, to move back like the shorelines and kind of what happens to these, these other icons and these other like, sure. kind of artifacts of culture that either have to stay and either be lost or we can transplant them, right? Um, so I think that's a fascinating topic. Yeah. Shifting gears for the sake of time, um, and thank you so much for sharing about that. I wanted to touch upon three projects of yours. Mm. Um, well, the, the, the firm, and then I think one specifically that you worked on hands-on. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now so that you can um, be visually reminded, but I'm sure that you know exactly which ones I'm talking about. So the first project that's on screen um, is the, the Hudson Long Dock Park in New York. And 
the other ones that I want to talk about are the Buffalo Bayou Gardens and the Arboretum in Houston. Um, I picked two specifically in Houston um, for the reason that I wanted to ask you um, their performance after Hurricane um, Katrina. And then the other part of it is, um, and Hurricane Harvey, so, sorry. And the other part of it is, is this idea of building with the intention to get people closer to water's edge, specifically in Hudson. Um, yeah. And if I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit more about this project first, the Hudson one. Well, um, you know, I talk about Long Dock Park a lot, um, in part because I spent 18 years on it. Mm. And I, it's also my hometown. So I, uh, I grew up here. Uh, I knew this piece of property. My father worked in the factory next door that became the Dia Foundation. And um, uh, so it was, a, in, you know, an enormous... Um, um, stroke of luck, really, to be asked to come back here and work on a site that that I knew as uh, you know just like a poison uh, nightmare. I see um, the historical photos, and they're incredible. Here's an important story to tell. We started the project in fall of 2003, and we worked for more than a year on a project that would have put a hotel on the site inside a park. A very novel idea. I was intrigued by that, very much intrigued by it. Um, and the reason for that is that Scenic Hudson had um, gone to the city of Beacon after purchasing the land and getting the remediation underway and said, you know, they wanted to build a park and they were going to start you know, soliciting proposals and come to the city with a plan to, you know, for a park. And, you know, there's all the right reasons to do that. You know, the city of Beacon had almost been cut off from its waterfront over the years through an urban renewal period that decimated the fabric between the river and, um, and Main Street, which is an amazing street. And it's a beautiful town. When I was growing up, it was a rough place, but it's really uh, it's now a very vital, vital city. Um, and, and the city said, we don't, you know, we don't want only a park. We want development. We want an activation. And so they conceived a plan which would have put a 130 room hotel here. And um, as you can imagine, it was going to be a long skinny building sort of where this, uh, you know, right here where I'm drawing a line. And, you know, it was, it was a very interesting proposal um, because I, we felt we were breaking ground in a way, thinking about, you know, the private um, uh, uh, performance needs and, and um, functions of a hotel environment in a park, right, in, in, a, in a truly public uh, realm and, and something that is right on the waterfront. And by the way, Scenic Hudson, you know, it, been for already its 50 year um, existence, been essentially the watchdog for development along the Hudson. So, uh, in a way, we're in a position of having to test out their own convictions about, or, or maybe to say it differently, to make a, uh, a demonstration of a viable, resilient, we wouldn't have said it then, um, waterfront development. So we were all very keen on that. It's so interesting. Um, in the second year of the project, in 2004, we were still working on a hotel project. And we, we, were, we had a, a meeting with um, you know, our ecology team and the developer and the scenic Hudson team and so on. And a good, good meeting, good, good kind of project. Um, meeting kind of maybe in schematic design. And the next day, the, the uh, Scenic Hudson project manager called me, again, this is 2004, and she said, um, there was a topic we, we meant to get to yesterday and we didn't, and I just want to kind of put a bug in your ear and see if you have an immediate re response, but we're going to be looking for a more formal response. From you. She said, what, did, what is our view about the impending sea level rise, and how is that going to affect our design here? And I said, Marjorie, I have no idea. 
because in 2004, this wasn't really a topic of discussion. Yeah. And so I, I love pointing that out, especially to the, you know, young audiences, students who have grown up, you know, faced with this problem, right? Mm -hmm. It's quite a new problem for most of us. Um, but boy, has the world changed around that topic. Um, you know, so anyway, we, we really had to get busy to understand, you know, the, 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 the phenomenon of, um, of sea level rise and also to try to predict its, uh, its implications for, for design. And this is before any government kind of like guidelines and like uh, projections had come out. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, Noah was probably working on this, but uh, it wasn't sort of common currency yeah. at all. I mean, if it were, I'd have known about it. You know, right. Working on coastal sites for all of my professional life. Um, all the green you're looking at here, every bit of it, is made land, right? It's fill. It's it's essentially basalt rock that was um, used to make railroad sidings, which did this. And um, you know, it was a big kind of trade hub with a ferry launching from here across the river to Newburgh. And this was a basically a you know a 20th century trade route through New England and New York and further west. Uh, this was one of the major ways that um, uh, shipping occurred. And so, um, you know, then it was degraded. It was the siding wasn't used anymore after the Newburgh Beacon Bridge was built in the 1960s. Um, transportation changed pretty dramatically in that period of, you know, building the interstates. And uh, the docks declined. Um, the land was sold to private ownership. It became um, what we now call an autom automobile disassembly plant, uh, well, and a gas holder site, and so on. It had berms, you know, containment berms around it, and so on. Um, so we had this phenomenon of um, land that uh, was porous, and we had upwelling brackish water coming sometimes all the way to the surface. Um, we had also impoundments that were already designated as jurisdictional wetlands kind of in this zone right here. Uh, of course, they were, uh, they were a result of kind of moving fill around and so on. Um, but they became wetlands that we had to protect. Uh, so, uh, you know, just a very complex hydrological and ecological circumstance. It was a you know, real learning curve for us. Essentially, what we did was to build, extend that wetland and build inter new intertidal wetlands, and then um, a uh, kind of containment wetland here, which is, in a, you know, in a, is, is connected, you know, in a marginal way uh, in, for, um, uh, performance in heavy storm events. While building this project in four phases, we just completed the final phase one year ago. Um, and that was essentially due to um, the, the kind of the rolling um, uh, remediation uh, phases. Hmm. Um, we had Hurricane Irene and um, there was another hurricane that, that came blasted through here. Within, uh, within one year of each other, we had two hurricanes. In both cases, this, the construction site was submerged except for the kind of um, the land buttresses that we had already built in place. These are actually about debris protection. They keep the debris on the shore. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's another one here, and then there's another one here, which we just finished last year. Um, anyway, what we proved through the construction of this was that we were, in fact, building a resilient system. We were building a system that could flush itself. And we had phenomenal success in the uh, plant communities that we placed there. And I have to say, it's proud because, um, you know, we were learning about resilience and making a resilient site.
Yeah. And this was, I assume there weren't, there weren't a lot of modeling that you could have done to predict like how it was going to perform in a, you know, for example, in a hurricane, right? And, you know, if, I would say that we had, a, we had, you know, very good engineers, you know, site engineer and hydrologist to work with, uh, a great ecologist. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, sometimes it felt a little bit like fumbling in the dark. Yeah. Uh, we were guessing at some things and, um, you know, we, we just didn't really have um, failures. We were building a beach. The beach failed a little bit because it's very hard to build a beach. Um, uh, and, but it's it's there and it's working. There's a kayak pavilion right in that location there and um, you know that's a big success on the Hudson. Um, in any case, uh, yeah we were learning about resilience while building it. Yeah, I hear that. Yeah, it sounds like an amazing process and the fact that it was like your home just makes it so much more personal to you. Um, very meaningful for me, yeah. Yeah, that was fantastic. And how how has the the like the kind of the the welcoming from the the city how has it been for the project? Has it been impatient because it took so long? Um, are they kind of happy with the product? I can't imagine they're not. But we opened. I mean, the first phase of the project, which was a combination of an artwork here by George Trakis and the reconstruction of the wetlands right there, we opened that up. I think in 2009. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's had a kind of, um, you know, opening up over time. But I, I, what I can tell you is that, uh, and my cousins uh, who, who live in the area still um, have verified this for me, but it gets incredible use. And I think, uh, I actually know somebody, you know, who lives in Garrison, one the next town over, who walks here every day at the end of the day. Um, wow. I think that this park has really reconnected the city of Beacon with, with the Hudson River. Yeah. yeah, it's a mission accomplished then. Yeah, yeah. And so the lessons that you and the firm kind of learned there, were they kind of taken and grown in other sites, but potentially the ones that I mentioned in Houston? Um, how did that How did that function? How did you build upon that success? And I mean, I guess it was like a rolling success since the project just finished like, its last phase last year. Yeah, that's right. Um, in in Houston, I think the problems are different. You know, the, the issues are not tidal. Um, certainly, they're uh, hydrological, but they're not um, brackish or tidal. And um, they're rivering, and they're about storm events. And in the case of Buffalo Bayou, and in the case of um, the Arboretum, um, which we can talk about in a minute. Uh, it's really desertification. So let's go back to the bayou, and I have to always give a huge um, shout out. I mean, really major, major credit to the SWA group, SWA they call them now, um, because you know they worked for two decades in a pro bono way to get a coalition of people. A, um, to build a coalition, really a force of consensus around the need to reform the value. And so for them, it's a 20 some year effort. And we were brought in to do two pieces of it. And, um, um, you know, I think that might have been because of our deep familiarity with the kind of the southern coast, Gulf Coast. Palette, planting palette, and um, my partner Doug is you know, from Louisiana, and so we, we've done lots of work in the coast of Louisiana, and you know had already learned a lot. So um, I think this was a particular focus on, um, I guess, what we would call a resilient palette and um, and good principal soils, which. Uh, you know, Hurricane Harvey tested very, very, very deeply, uh, and I think this work came out very well. Hmm. So there was really a um, pretty great recovery on the whole, uh, on the bayou in particular, in the, in the sections that we designed. So um, it's a good story. Um, this is how we have to work in the city, and you know, Houston is a real example of, um, you know, where you know, a major infrastructure reform really had to occur mm -hmm. um, to make it to make it 
to take it out of the danger zone, to be honest, from a flood point of view, but also to give something to the citizens that is, you know, this remarkable connected greenway. Yeah. So no, no, I've heard great stories about people that have seen the transformation of Houston from like the early 2000s till today. And even the posts like Hurricane Harvey floodings, um, they still swear that it's, it's like amazing that all the work that took to transform um, like their actual interactions day to day, how they get to work, how they recreate, how they relax and how do they recuperate from like their tired week. Um, and, I, and I used to visit when I was a child and I remember that I, I, I could, I give you, I've seen drawings, I've seen pictures of what it looks like now, like for example, in the Bayou, but it's hard for me to reconciliate that with the memory that I have of Houston being like a very um, like just gray and, and impermeable kind of surface area. Um, yeah. which is, it's just amazing the turnaround that it's taken. Yeah, it's a, a good story uh, and a really, a, I think, an exemplar. And interestingly, you know, m multiple design firms working together, something we spoke about earlier. In this case, you know, delivering CDs and doing construction administration alongside each other. Mm -hmm. um, and, and actually, in the case of the Arboretum, you know, that's, that's a collaborative effort, too, with Design Workshop. Um, at, which, has, which has gone, you know, extremely well. They're, um, their folks in Austin. Uh, the issue here was uh, that increasing temperature and desiccation of the um, essentially what was a, I want to say a, um, a degraded pine forest this mm -hmm. became the arboretum. Well, that was opportune. Um, I think that you know the very the very quick reality that they faced was complete colony collapse of the pine. Pine could not just not survive the extreme conditions that have come to bear on Houston heat-wise um, and drought-wise. So what we really had to do here, along with you know, Design Workshop, was to kind of reconceive the savannah. Hmm. So, you know, we've only made a few smaller interventions so far. But I think the bigger idea here is, is really to grow back a palette of the most well-adapted plants to the new condition. So you know, I, I, um, I don't like to use the word resiliency here too much. I think really this is adaptation. Um, what's sounds... happening, right. So plant, the plant um, habitat is migrating, right? And so um, you know, we were essentially trying to grapple with the existing conditions and recognizing that they're going to get drier and hotter, they're going to get more extreme. You know, what, what is the, um, what's the palette? You know, what's, what's our medium, you know, in that hotter, drier environment? Really interesting. Uh, we've implemented, you know, we've just, just finished uh, this past year, uh, a great boardwalk project. And, um, uh, you know, it too got flooded, but survived well. And I saw that a lot of the boardwalks and a lot of like the kind of the, the plans, guidance of the, the arboretum tend to be structured in a way that they'll survive if there's like a, a flooding event and if there's like yeah. an intense downpour, um, which I think is extremely well planned. Yeah. But going back to this idea of like of, of species like migration um, and changing like kind of like climate zones, is there is there like is there like a social pushback on that? Is, are there, are, were there people in the table or maybe in the planning phases where they were saying, no, we want to keep what Houston is today, meaning like what it used to be? Was there any of that? Uh, only a little, um, but I think that is a natural response for people. Uh, and when we talk about the Eastern Shore, I can speak more about that. Um, you know, in New England, for you know, 25 years, I've been um, having to explain to people who live in a pine forest that it won't be there forever. Oh yeah. So you know that dynamic has been you know is, is really a, a deep part of landscape architecture. What's newer is the migration of so so you know the pine forest is short lived because pines only live to a hundred years or so, and so you know, early work at Simon's uh, Rock College in the, Ber in the Berkshires, where, you know, the, everything was conceived around this beautiful character of very mature pine forests and, you know, needles on the ground and all of that. That was, that was the environment people loved. 
and it was falling apart. It was very hard for them to give it up, and they want, you know, they, their natural tendency would be to plant another pine forest. Mm -hmm. That's, but, but the forest in the Berkshires wants to be deciduous, mm -hmm. except on the steepest slopes. And so, uh, you know, it, it really took some doing, but, you know, so we're, we're, we're used to, you know, developing the arguments for persuasiveness around landscape change. We do it with every client because, um, you know, there are just qualities that people want to stick around. And so, but at, but at the same time, I mean, you know, in our tools now to get someone excited about what this new kind of savanna would look like is helpful, you know. It was hard 20 years ago to be convincing of that, but with um, photorealism in our uh, drawings, like this one, you know, I, I think we, we, can, we can make uh, um, exhibits that are pretty persuasive to people about the future we're predicting. I agree with that. And maybe this is too far up Ecology Road, but it kind of talking to this, this, this visualized, this completed reality, right? Like you usually show drawings and they're mature trees, right? We're, we're really showing what it's going to look like 20, 30 years from now, if, if that. Um, and then a lot of times, clients, cities, governments, they, they, want to, they want to go the extra mile and spend the extra dollars to make sure that their, their trees are mature. Um, so, you know, the, the short political cycle can see the benefit. Um, have you seen or perhaps like you've worked with like ecologists that, that make the case against that, that make the case for planting saplings, for example, so that they're able to properly adapt to their new environment? Um, okay. Just curious. Yeah. Yeah, that's you know that's another that's another kind of lifelong discussion, mm -hmm. um, and you know I I really get both sides of that. You know, um, the city of Cambridge is is basically working on two inch trees, and we were we 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 just don't like to plant two inch trees because they're vulnerable. Um, but, but but that's the economics. Uh, that have they've been working out for you know quite a number of years says that they, the best they can do is a lot of two-inch trees. Um, we have, um, you know, done some really interesting, you know, restoration projects and um, forest edge projects where we might plant, you know, two or three hundred one-inch trees. Um, you know, at the Clark Art Institute in Berkshires, I, I would say that, you know, we, we planted a thousand trees, uh, you know, in three phases of work. Um, but I would say that um, more than half of them were one and two inch trees. Well, we were making thicket. Yeah. So uh, in that situation, I mean, the thicket is great and they will either, you know, be, you know, culling trees out, which they have already started to do, or they will sort of self prune. Um, so, you know, that is, that is a kind of an age old practice. So, um, you know, sort of growing a forest age. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, having an impact on, on a street with a, a new public realm, you know, we're going to, we're going to do our best to plant five or six inch caliper trees that have, you know, 18 or 25 feet of growth already. So, and, and, you know, we have to compensate for the recovery time, you know, typically about a year per inch. So, you know, those trees are under stress for four or five years. And you know this is a this is a big part of our business. Um, you know, looking after that problem. Yeah. I uh, I hope I hope that that balance is is continue to like be like discussed, especially with with like big municipal projects that are trying to increase their urban cover. This is Houston after Hurricane Harvey, um, and the fact that that projects like the ones that you guys worked on are are resilient enough to be able to kind of retain or recover the performance that they had before is absolutely amazing. Um, and I hope that we get more projects like that. Now, I want to shift gears to your Virginia project, um, the yeah. studio in Accomack and Northampton counties. I'm very familiar with the, with the pressures that they face looking at subsidence and sea level rise. Um, yeah. But I'm really curious to like, what captured your attention? Was it just a statistical like marvel of these counties and the, the pressures they face? Or was there something more to it? Honestly, there was a personal connection. I have a, I have a friend who uh, grew up at the very southern end of the peninsula. Mm -hmm. Lives in California, but 
um, you know, retains a home there, his family's there, his mother's there, his cousins and all. And uh, he, he has, uh, had, uh, for a number of years, he's been concerned that there isn't um, a, a true reckoning of the sea level rise issue um, in local culture. And, you know, so he called me and said, I just want to talk to you about that. I don't know what to do, but I'm motivated to do something. And I said, well, why don't we conduct a studio and, you know, just sort of understand what the issues are and make an appraisal of that. And then let's speculate on, you know, um, you know, what could be done. Uh, I'll go back to something that you spoke about earlier, Daniel, which is the rhetoric around um, resilience and um, adaptation, or, or, or more specifically, migration. Um, so on the one hand, I think that the, the resiliency efforts that, that we can identify with Rebuild by Design in New York, and we did one in Connecticut in Bridgeport, um, is, is largely about um, remaining in place and, and reinforcing. Mm -hmm. And the other position, which some people have staked out very firmly, is retreat. I mean, this is all common parlance for you, I know, um, and probably for your audience as well. Um, but it was, it, was, it was not new to me, but it, it was, um, let's say, that I was able to confront that in a deeper way with this project. So it interested me to um, find the ground between retreat and remain. Mm -hmm. Because um, when we talk about remain in place, we talk about livelihoods. And that's how I pitched it to the students. Um, and, you know, they were asked to find their own sites and also um, make a case, you know, somewhere in that spectrum between retreat and remain in place. Um, we're looking at Willis Wharf here. Um, oh, no, we're looking at uh, Wachapi. Yeah, this is, this is Wachapi. Beautiful photograph um, by Gordon Campbell, um, who gave us permission to use his work and uh, had some great, we had some great chats. Um, this is on the seaside, so just to the right you know, six or seven miles out would be the barrier islands. And, um, you know, what we have here, yeah, so there you can see the barrier islands disappearing. You know, there's a 70 mile long system of barrier islands that is disappearing. And we, we were actually able to go out with some watermen to walk the barrier islands and we could see where storms had very recently broken an island into two. Um, they are simply disappearing. And so, you know, the, um, that's a great image you have. Um, you can see the threat, um, you know, it's kind of plain as day. You know, what, what my friend Tom told me over the phone as we were talking about, you know, how to approach this was that um, if you talk to the locals, they mainly describe this as erosion. And, you know, it's a conservative view, but you know, they don't necessarily buy that the sea level is rising, nor do they accept that the land is subsided. We know it is. You know, we've talked with coastal geologists, and because of a meteoric event here, uh, you know, three million years ago, I believe, um, there is a gradual subsidence. I mean, it's microscopic, but um, in truth, the combination of these phenomena means that, you know, sea level is rising five million years a year here. Mm -hmm. And that's much faster than even Miami. I mean, it's, it's faster than almost everywhere in the world. But the threat is, the risk is very, very high for, you know, these incredible places. Um, and, you know, essentially the employment picture here is, you know, People, the largest employers are, uh, are um, uh, chicken farms uh, and processors. So Tyson's Food is a huge employer on this peninsula. And that, that causes issues too, of, you know, in terms of runoff and so on. The ecology is, is pretty well out of whack 
uh, anywhere near uh, uh, you know chicken pie. And then um, and the others are are water. So there's so there's people working in the processing plants. And then there's two other real populations here: people who are farming either salt hay or uh, in the large part this used to be cotton. It used to be a bread basket actually. It used to produce incredible um, produce and. And um, there was a great system of rail uh, depots and so on. Um, Cape Charles became a wealthy town because of this. It's a prosperous town, I guess you'd say. Um, and then the watermen, you know, who are essentially going out every day, uh, every day that they're allowed to, um, for shrimping and uh, clamming and crabbing and so on. Um, the famous blue crab is, uh, you know, a big, a big. Um, means of employment uh, here on the peninsula. So, you know, there was a bit of denial, let's say, of, uh, I know you face it too, denial of the problem. Um, and so, you know, we, we dug into it in a pretty interesting way. So I'll share my screen to show you in, in a summary way. Um, uh, in a summary way. I do so now. Okay. Just, that. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So, okay, you should see that now, right? It's yes. Yeah. So, um, this is uh, the first page. I'm just going to put you and me back up here. So, I'm looking at you while I speak. Um, this is the first page of a pretty big. Um, um, compilation of uh, projects. And the reason I wanted to talk about it was, well, there's a couple things. One is that um, because the, the boundary between land and water is dynamic on a daily basis and obviously, you know, through time, I ask the students to draw the peninsula as if it were continuous with the water. So the means of drawing then became um, streets and parcel boundaries. And there was a kind of a rhetoric, there, there was a conceptual idea there that you know, these things um, will change. Under Virginia law, if your land is underwater, you no longer own it. And you know, then you have to get a tax abatement and so on. But um, so, so this drawing is also an itinerary of all of 12, the 12 projects in the, in the class over the semester. So we start, and this was also the order for the final review in, uh, in December, Saxis Island, um, which is here. I don't know, I, I guess I need my annotation renewed. I can see your mouse. I think if you point yeah. at it. Okay. Saxis Island, which is here, um, is disappearing. Uh, most of the people who live there work elsewhere. They work. They work on land. Um, and, and you know, if I were to draw the shoreline right now, it's it's around here. So you have to go across this causeway to get to Saxis. Someday that causeway is going to be underwater. So. Um, so this student's project was about how portions of Saxis Island, which are upland today, could remain in place. But more importantly, could, could people's attachment to their place survive with an island that is less than half of the size that it is today? Very, just an interesting project. So, so as I narrate these, Projects you will get a, a real sense of the issues overall. The next one down is, is Davis Wharf, a place where um, there's a, a creek, a tide creek, and there's a public dock on one side and, uh, and a private boat launch on the other side. And um, you know the docks are going to be low water. So this, this was a project to imagine what happens through inundation over time, how you migrate those assets upward and back okay. to the upland. Um, in Cherry Stone Inlet, um, which is the next one down here, 
um, the student took a single family holding, which is farmland, and predicted a future for it, which included having to move their home back on the land, having to uh, build a protective dike to, to, to sustain land-based agriculture for some period of time, but ultimately how to operate that dike in a way that would migrate the production towards aquaculture. So, you know, this is in another, in a way, another kind of right to remain project. But recognizing that if you're going to remain, you're going to be adapting pretty seriously. You're going to be investing in, you know, sort of rebuilding your home and rebuilding your driveway and so on. So uh, it was nice to get to that scale of a of project. Um, then just south of there in Cape Charles, we had two projects. Um, that were about um, how you deal with um, the problem of a, of a historic district having to migrate. And so combination of protective measures and retreat measures. Then um, going across to Machipango, we had a project that um, um, took advantage of the interesting culture around um, land trusts today to uh, form a kind of common that would connect the barrier island center, which is in the middle of the peninsula, to a water site that they operate uh, through a manipulation of um, uh, frontages uh, and um, the creation of shared, shared assets, essentially. Um, then um, let me go all the way to the south, Fisherman's Island. Uh, actually has been created in the last hundred years uh, out of a shipwreck. It's, it's taking the sand from all the way north, catching it, and this is the only island that's growing. They're all disappearing but fishing. It's, it's, it's protected habitat, you know, there's endangered species of turtles and birds, and um, so the project was about creating a way for people to experience it as a kind of observatory of the phenomenon of change. Beautiful project. Had that student in the first few weeks had studied, I gave them all topics, and this topic was sand. Tell us about sand. What are people doing with sand today? So beach replenishment, sand mining, um, you know, sand dynamics, and you know, the welding of uh, sandbars and so on. Then, then up in oyster. Um, and Willis Wharf, you know, we had projects that were about um, adapting, you know, waterfront sites. Um, in Oyster, it was another another barrier islands center of property, and this was a very close look at uh, again the migration of crop over time, looking at um, uh, hog island figs and um, uh, ghost forests, which are you know essentially uh, hardwood or pine forest that are dying because of um, the change in uh, water elevation and salinity. She was looking at, you know, the fact that the soil is getting more saline by a, at a rate of a foot a year. And so what does that mean for a managed ecology? How do you set ecological management goals? Um, the Willis Wharf project was about remaining in place, um, again, with protective dikes and a gradual shift from farming to aquaculture. And then two projects in Wachapri, um, one about migrating the town back to um, a, a, a kind of safer upland um, uh, site within reach of these uh, within reach of the shore and the last one um, I, I really think you'll be interested in this was a project around the productive breakdown of things that have to be moved so um, you know this student looked at um, the fact that all our FEMA dollars around retreat or resiliency are post-disaster funding. Mm -hmm. What if we what if we move that funding or a portion of that funding to preventative measures? 
the hard concept to get around, you know, we were working with Jesse Keenan, who we may know, um, you know, who's, who's really staked out his position on um, retreat. Um, uh, we were working with Jesse to, you know, imagine the kind of policy shift that, and what would be required to make that policy shift to be able to just distribute resources, you know, not during, a, not, not, not after a disaster, but before. And so this student looked at, you know, what happens when you essentially, like in Houston, um, you've had to do it in Miami, elsewhere, um, where you basically have to sort debris for months. And, you know, what, what is that sorting like? Could you, in fact, you know, um, produce a culture where people are, are recognizing that their properties are failing and break them down and sort and reuse. Hmm. So um, fascinating, fascinating project. Um, so and then we had one last one, which was really just about the um, very subtle thing about um, the memory of um, what remains when retreat happens. So, you know, for me, I have to say that um, uh, it was a tremendous learning experience. I, I had a great group of students, and um, I'm working now on um, the beginnings of, uh, of an exhibition uh, around this work. I'm sure it would be great. And that I really like the kind of how expansive the approaches were to, to deal with this, this balance between thriving in place and, and adapting to a new normal in a, in a non-COVID reference. Um, yeah. And I, this, this idea of, of FEMA dollars spent in a different manner, at least in a chronological order of disaster events, I think, and I remember there was an NPR article that came out last year and they were looking at the, the social inequality behind the access to, to disaster relief funds. Um, and when I actually, I worked with Keenan on, on a few things and his postdoc that actually, A.R. Siders, who works in Managed Retreat, I think she's in Delaware now, um, and we looked at North Carolina and, and really trying to figure out how the decisions were made to, to armor the coasts, right? So which communities were, a, were kind of the, the benefactors of this, this, this federal funding to, to be able to continue their livelihoods and which ones had to go to buyout dollars post disasters. Um, so there's a really big social component there that I think uh, needs to be talked about and it needs to be part of the conversation early on um, right. otherwise the new settlements the new places where people are going to have to go are going to be a replication of the, the current status um, and so that's that's more on the sociological side but I think part of of a lot of this this um, this topic and a lot of the projects that your students touch upon really delved into the human component right really delved into how do humans have to adapt um, their livelihoods and how do their memories shift and how do their like identities go along with that right um, so I think it was, it was a magnificent studio and to hear that that first there was a uh, like a personal attachment to the area definitely adds and I think you can see that through through your your passion speaking about the, the students projects too mm -hmm. well like I said you know great learning experience for me and um, you know now it's a topic that um, you know while it's while it's well it's been it's been you know in our midst for quite a while um you know now it's really a front burner topic for me. so i'm sure it'll open a lot of different other like projects that that are trying to figure out what lessons did you learn and speaking of lessons um as a, a final kind of trying to pick your brain what um what lessons do you think can be extracted from from this this study this this kind of like uh the speculative study from these two counties and do some place, for example, like, like South Florida. Um, so I'm going to show you um, kind of the, the area that I would like to kind of talk to in Miami and, and then you can, you can tell me what you think. So this is a, this is a LIDAR model of, of Miami in general. So Miami, um, if you like your color scheme. <laughs> yeah, I know when I saw, when I saw that, uh, <laughs> that, that map, I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> I have been working on a few things for, um, for sea level rise and ocean climate justice and we've been trying to put some maps together um, yeah. and this has been a theme. And so Miami in general sits around kind of like this border here, uh, the proper city of Miami, and then you have Miami Beach along right. the coast. Yeah, I'm pretty familiar. I, I, uh, 
I used to go to Miami a lot. Uh, just because it was an exotic place that I could go to and come back from in three days. Yeah, that's uh, that's most people's. I think uh, familiarity with Miami is is a place to to, to just experience some R and R, um, and and really that comes to this idea that you can manipulate an environment for whatever like uses you can you can have for it, right? Um, and you can see the extent of where the Everglades used to be, right? Where it should be in a sense, um, and of course should is like a very loosely used word. Um, but you can see the natural ranges in the topography and the place that seemingly is flat, but when you really go into the, like the micro, the quotation marks, like the micro um, changes in topography, which are really talking about three, five feet differences, which are significant for the hydrology, um, it does create these like inundation zones, right? Just over the last four days there, we received over 15 inches of rain here in South Florida. Um, and this right here, if I, if I could, if I could spend another t like a few hours on on this map and I could put an overlay of like the actual rainfall data, I'm sure it would be over the places that are darker in this image. Um, you know, it's not a coincidence. Um, right. So, so I once like so this is more of like for like a general introduction into Miami for anyone that's not familiar. Um, but really wanted to examine kind of the the experience and like the interaction with with. The land, right? So this photograph that's overlaid on, on the map is from 1940. So it was an aerial survey um, of part nor in North Miami. It's called Little River. It's a, a dredged and widened river that used to be kind of like a pretty standard South Florida river that was um, like slow moving. There are manatees today, and I'm sure back then there were. Um, there probably even were some alligators and saltwater crocodiles, as far as I'm concerned. But what I really want to to highlight is that that the, the boundaries to the, the expansion of the river, so the river banks, right? So like the tow-ins and looking at the curbs, they, they had to be respected, right? So if you look at this area here, um, the river obviously grew at certain, age, at certain points of tide, right? And this is before the technology for like pumps and before we had like a good grasp of this because that really came online after the 60s. Um, the development really had to, to kind of respect those boundaries, right? And so as time went on, we, we didn't see that anymore. Um, and, and so we started seeing like the build out of the places that are under five feet, right? Yeah. And so now what I'm, I've been talking with the county, Miami-Dade County, and they're looking at Little River as an area of focus to see new projects. Um, and so the question of the current built environment sitting on top of this very precarious like nature, right? Really, this this really vulnerable space um, begs the question: like, what can we do here in in such a densely populated area, and at the same time, an area that needs to be prepared for opportunity, right? Like, there is no if. Um, like, these are areas that need to be planned for now. Um, and so, I wanted to ask, how would you approach this, right? Like, if you if you were tasked, like for example, with like an option studio, so we can go into the speculative realm. Where would you begin? <clears throat> well, I guess I would I would look at um, I would look at risk in temporal ways. So uh, you know, try to identify you know what is under threat most now, and mm -hmm. you know maybe maybe you do that in in sort of ten year horizons um, because I think that you know it's it's a reasonable prediction. You can't say it's any certainty. It's a reasonable prediction that things are going to increase, uh, you know, in, in um, uh, inundation, uh, increase in salinity, and um, uh, increase acidification, uh, but also desert desertification. Um, but I think you're talking mainly about flood risk. Um, so someone's already probably done that, um, and, it, and I, it seems to me that you know this is uh, this this is this could only be imagined as a kind of 50 year or maybe 80 year project mm -hmm. um, where you identify the assets that are most at risk on a 20 year horizon. It takes about 20 years to do an infrastructure project, right? So it took 15 years to do long time. Um, so, uh, you know, that, uh, that strikes me as, uh, as one of the most important things to do is to, is to set out a kind of temporal framework 
um, which says these things are most at risk. And um, then I think you're going to find um, likely, you know, a combination of of um, retreat and reinforced. Um, I, I'm just not a believer that you're going to get one or the other here. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about people's bungalows, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you know, also th there's there's the aspect of uh, you know, sort of racialized topography here, right? Mm -hmm. That um, we're very very likely to um, see that um, you know, low low income families, maybe single parent households, you know, are in the mix here and. Um, maybe immigration, you know, is another factor. Likely it is. Right? So, um, I, I like the nature of the problem being that you know very complex web, um, and you know thinking about it kind of sectionally over time is uh, the way we, the way that we would kind of put an analytical framework on it. Definitely, and that brings me to to I think a point that I made at the beginning was this kind of this question and, and ideally you would really have to balance the three really looking at preventing right so trying to manage a project with sustainable materials trying to minimize the carbon footprint that you are contributing and then there's also the question of preparing right so um, if we're really trying to, to figure out a way to build resilience in the form of staying in place then then how do we do that but then the last is adapting right so adapting to a changing coastline adapting to more sunny day flooding adapting to higher salinity levels, um, you know, how, and, and if, and I guess I'm gonna put you on the spot here, if you had to pick one of these three to focus on, which do you think would be the most like productive in terms of, of forward thinking? It depends on the time horizon. Because, um, I, mean, I, I hope that doesn't sound like a cop out, but because re retreat is, 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 is in a way, I mean, you could say that retreat is the safe option, but the most complicated one. Mm -hmm. um, that ad reinforcement and adaptation are surely necessary in the short term. I mean, if you, you talk about moving families, you know, Governor Cuomo, you know, in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, you know, came out very strongly for retreat. And then he had to kind of modify his position because you're talking about families moving, but if you talk about them moving in 25 years, that's quite different than saying you can't rebuild now. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why you know, I became interested in the gray zone, you know, between these two kind of extreme positions. Um, I think that's a perfect answer. I mean, like you like you said, I think if you present the options to communities of we might have to relocate 20 years from now, and if we start planning for this now, um, there might be a bit like a, a better reception to that idea, and that makes a lot of sense. It, again, that's that's that it, part of that is evidence based to the degree that you can use good predictive models, evidence based levels of risk. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you, 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 you'll end up saying to someone, you know, you're the most in danger soon. <laughs> and, you know, they might just say, well, thanks. See you later. <laughs> um, or they might say, you know, well, I, I, I guess I need to be thinking about my future. And that's where I think, you know, the, the Eastern Shore thing for me, I've never done a project like this before where I unleashed students on 12 different sites. You know, it was insane carrying like 12 projects around my head. But, um, for me, that was a vehicle to unearth like so many issues, right? I usually define a, a, an option studio very narrow. Um, but in this case, you know, it wasn't exactly scattershot, but it was, uh, it had, the, it, I, I just wanted, you know, the range of, um, of issues to be foregrounded and, and, and in many cases, students were talking with residents, talking with the coastal geologist who has a center in Wachapri, um, talking with the director of the uh, Barrier Island Center, talking with watermen. 
and in the end, you know, that's what we're dealing with, right? It's people's existence, people's memory, their livelihood, you know. And 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 this is why that project came to me in the first place. Because someone cares about the heritage, uh, the fact that this family has been there since the 17th century. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they came uh, with land, a land grant from the crown. And so, you know, there's a deep attachment. It's pretty hard to say, you know, you're going to move. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, and I, I think, so I, I can imagine, so my, my option student at the GSD was very broad. And so the, the professor kind of just told us, here's the site. Then you find your own project within this yeah. 900 hectare site, and we were you know, pretty much what, what I did. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's challenging, but I think it's it also. Miles was so <laughs> I can't imagine. I can't imagine they took it lightly. Um, but the results of the, the the students' projects really kind of are, I think, a representative of the macrocosm of this issue, which is all of these considerations are valid, and all of these considerations need to be taken if we're really thinking about how can this community like, react to this, right? Um, yeah. And so I think in that case, I think in your studio's case, it, it, was, it was the perfect space to do that. It was the perfect space to leave it open-ended and allow the students to really realize what are the issues that are they're, they're, they, can, they want to tackle. Um, right. It was a good approach. And I, I, I can tell you, you know, as a, maybe a final comment, that the students that we're teaching, you're not, you're not far from them because you're a recent graduate, mm -hmm. are um, without any doubt at all deeply committed to these issues. And you know, that's really, for me, that's incredibly satisfying. They want to be working on these issues. Well, we also recognize that it's the future, right? Like if, we, if we're not, if now, we're, if now we're fluent in this language and we're not fluent with the work, then I think it also puts us at a disadvantage to, to adapting to the new like, occupational norm, right? Like they, firms, whether they want to or not, they're going to either have to hire consultants to become proficient or they're going to have to hire professionals who already have experience with this. Um, and I mean, in my own experience, that's kind of where, where I took that decision. It was to, to kind of seeing what I'm passionate about and at the same time realizing that the future is pointing in one direction and so I better kind of get prepared for that. Um, so there's even like an intellectual preparedness that you have to have to take with climate change. Well you seem like you've landed in a great spot. Oh, I'm extremely happy. <laughs>